hope you have your Bibles with you this morning. I would ask that you open them to Habakkuk. Habakkuk is the sixth in our series of minor prophets, and it, Habakkuk has a strange name, by the way, except for in the Bible. I've never known a guy named Habakkuk. His name might sound strange, but his book is going to consider a number of questions that we commonly ask, like, how am I ever going to make it through this season, you know? Have you ever gone through some season of your life, maybe you're in one right now, where things seem to be falling apart all around you, and as you think about the future, your prospects don't look any better? That's certainly how it was for Habakkuk. Habakkuk lived and prophesied around 600 B.C. It was a time when things were unraveling fast in the southern kingdom of Israel, which was called Judah. And if you know anything about Israel's history, they'd gone through a civil war. The northern kingdom and the southern king kingdom had split. The northern kingdom had a series of really, 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 really bad and rebellious kings. So they were carried off into exile by Assyria in 722 B.C. But then after that, Judah began to have her own series of bad political leaders at a time of spiritual decline. And so God sent a drought that devastated the land to the point that their fields were producing little to no fruit. Their cattle had either all starved to death or been stolen. And Habakkuk describes the situation himself in chapter 3 and verse 17. He says, the fig tree does not blossom. There's no fruit on the vines. The produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no flood. The flock is cut off from the fold and there is no herd in the stalls and folks basically that reads like a hebrew country song my wife left me i lost my job my truck broke down and my dog died it's kind of how it looks for like habakkuk things are as bad in israel as they've ever been but the point was the region of judah was undergoing a starvation level social collapse that's what was happening think Europe at the end of World War II or something like that. And in addition to that, the Babylonians presenting a looming, presented a looming threat. And God had told Habakkuk and the other prophets, Babylon's coming. They're going to invade you and they're going to destroy. And then they would carry the rest of their survivors away captive. So Habakkuk asked, God, how are we going to make it? Now, folks, that was a situation they were in. And maybe you're in a situation, not the same, of course. Maybe you've got maybe a, a really bad medical diagnosis, or maybe you're going through a really tough time in your marriage, or maybe you're in a season of financial difficulty, and, and you don't know how you're going to get out of it. Or maybe you have an adult ch child that is not only not following after God, he or she is living a lifestyle that's totally at odds with what you believe. The book of Habakkuk was written for you, which leads to a second question that Habakkuk asked in this book. God, where are you? I thought you loved us. Listen to Habakkuk's opening statement. See if you relate to this. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Do you see that word to tolerate? Some versions say you look idly by. You idly look at wrong. Do you ever dare to think that? That God just seems to sit idly by while you suffer? And sometimes people wonder, God, are you even there? Sometimes our life feels like a really depressing TV series with one thing after another going wrong. And we wonder, how can those writers come up with some way to pull it all back together in the end? And it's all going to make sense. Is there ever going to be a happy ending to anything going on in my life? But sometimes you wonder, is life going to turn out like that? Shakespeare said, life is a tale told by an idiot sound and fury signifying nothing no happy ending no redeeming purpose in all that has happened which leads to a third question that habakkuk asked god we're going to get to that one question again how is this fair 
See, Babylon, who was going to cause Israel all these problems, catch this, was much more wicked and they were much more ungodly than Israel. So Habakkuk asked, God, how is it fair that we go through this while Babylon gets off scot-free? Everything they touch kind of works out for Babylon while we get terrorized. They get blessed. How's this fair, God? I thought you were just. He says something pretty bold to God in chapter 1 and verse 13. He said, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. Why then do you tolerate the treacherous? Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves? Folks, do you ever feel like that? Why does this person seem to get off and they didn't go through what you went through and you're the one who's tried to be faithful and you're the one who's trying to do things right, but you seem to be the one who's experiencing all the hardship. Those are questions that a lot of Christians ask. Folks, the book of Habakkuk is unusual in that it is not a sermon written to a nation like most of the other prophets gave. Instead, this is simply just a conversation between Habakkuk and God that Habakkuk wrote down later for us. And in the book, Habakkuk's going to present a, a series of complaints. And after he gives his complaints, he's going to say in chapter 2 and verse 1, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give when I'm rebuked. And then God's going to give him an answer. And Habakkuk is going to argue back with God and God is going to answer him again and flex his, his cosmic muscles a little bit and Habakkuk is going to be still. But as he does, he's going to offer one of the greatest statements of faith ever recorded in the Bible. And this book kind of gives us a glimpse in how faith grows. Rather than simply telling us what God says, the writer opens up his heart and lets, them, and lets us learn from his own struggle. Folks, several of the Psalms are like that. The book of Job is that way. You're just getting a recounting of the struggle. One of the other minor prophets is this way also. The book of Jonah is a story about a prophet who is struggling to love like God loves. Habakkuk's book is, for that reason at times, uncomfortably candid. He'll say things and you'll think, can you say that to God? Folks, you can learn a lesson from that. God is okay with your struggles. He's okay with your questions. See, when Habakkuk questioned God, God didn't snap back with, how dare does thou talkest to me that way, thou worm Habakkuk? Actually, he seems to welcome Habakkuk's questions. God even saw fit to record this in the Bible so it's preserved for future generations so we could learn from his questions. Folks, doubt is simply one of God's most common tools to drive you deeper into faith. Doubt is like a foot poised. You know, you got your foot up in the air to take a step. And the step can be forward or the step can be backward. But one thing is certain. You'll never go in any direction until you pick up that foot and put it down. It is true that doubt can drive you backwards into despair and unbelief. But it's also true that you're never going to take a step forward until you pick that, pick that foot up. And when you're going through a tough situation, <clears throat> excuse me, that is God's tool to get you to pick that foot up and to drive you deeper into faith. It's not that there are questions that cannot be answered. It's that there are questions that your experience of faith hasn't brought you to the place where you can answer them. And God needs to rally you and get you to go deeper with him so you can see that he's deeper and better than the pain you're going through. Habakkuk's faith was fragile. But so many times, so is ours. God was trying to strengthen it. And that's what you're going to see in this book. Alan Gardner was a missionary many years ago. He was an English missionary, one of the very first. He got shipwrecked on a very remote island off the coast of South America en route to be one of the first people to start a new mission work on the continent of South America. And after his ship got shipwrecked, they tried to stick it out. They tried to wait for somebody to come and rescue them, but nobody came. And finally, they died of starvation. 
before his ministry ever really began. And several months later, the rescuers finally discovered where they'd been shipwrecked, and they discovered the body of Gardner with his personal journal tucked underneath his body. And when they pulled it out, they noticed the last thing inscribed, and it was this. Psalm 3410, those that seek the Lord lack no good thing. Underneath that verse was his final phrase, I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. And a lot of people hear that and they think, goodness? How could you talk about the goodness of God at a time like that? Is that what you've been thinking about when you've been saying things to God like, God, I'm scared. God, I'm angry. God, why have you forsaken me? I was just trying to do what you wanted. See, Alan Gardner knew the secret that Habakkuk knew. And that's what I want to share with you because it's a power that will not only give you strength in tragic moments, it will help you in every moment. And it's one word, and it's the word hope. It's the most powerful force on the planet. Folks, there is a legendary experiment that was conducted at Johns Hopkins University several years ago in which a researcher was trying to determine how long a rat could swim. And if you just took rats and you threw them in the water in in like a a big jar or maybe a five-gallon bucket, they could only last for 10 minutes before they gave up strength and they drowned. But he discovered that if during that 10 minutes, he simply picked them up and lifted them out of the water for five or six seconds and then he put them back in and if he did that three times in the first 10 minutes then the rats would swim for more than 60 hours changing no factor except the introduction of hope gave the rats the ability to swim more than 100 times longer than they were able to swim without it my purpose is to give you all hope today so that you can keep swimming. For those of you that feel like God is nowhere to be found, for those of you who feel like your situation is hopeless, for those of you who are angry or even worse, numb toward God, I want you to find hope. So let's start with Habakkuk's complaint. Habakkuk's question is really an age-old problem. The world often doesn't seem like it's being ruled by a good, all-wise, all-powerful God. You know what philosophers call this? They call this the problem of evil. And they trace this all the way back to a 5th century Greek philosopher named Epicurus. Now, basically, Epicurus said it was this way. If God really is all-powerful, he could stop the evil. And if he really was really loving, he, wouldn't, he would want to stop it. So the fact that pain and suffering and injustice run rampant on the earth means that either God is not all powerful or he's not all good. How about a shortened version of that? If he's good, he would. If he could, he should. And since he does it, that means he isn't. That's what they were saying. This is an age-old problem, but here we see that Habakkuk framed it long before Epicurus did. Folks, we're not asking new questions. The earliest Bible writers were asking, I don't see how a good, wise, and powerful, and loving God is actually ruling the world. That's Habakkuk's complaint. God's answer. God's answer has basically four components. Habakkuk 1.5, God says, look among the nations and see. Wonder and be astounded, for I'm doing a work in your days that, would, that you would not believe if I told. He said, I'm doing something absolutely amazing, Habakkuk. I've got a much bigger plan than you realize. In the invasion of the Babylonians, I'm going to set up a situation that will more clearly display the rescuing work of my son. It is beyond anything you could understand at this moment, to the point that you wouldn't believe it even if I told you but it will lead to my glory and your ultimate salvation. The second component, Habakkuk 2.14. He says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. The bigger thing that I'm doing is covering the earth with the knowledge of my glory, which Habakkuk may not seem as important to you as having 
herds in your stalls or having bumper crops, but that is ultimately going to be a turn of events, and this turn of events is going to lead to a lot more people coming to salvation. Here's the third component, Habakkuk 2.4. The righteous shall live by his faith. Habakkuk, if you're going to walk with me in the world, it will have to be by faith, which means you must acknowledge there's a number of things you won't be able to fully see yet. And the fourth component is this, Habakkuk 2.20. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Folks, the last thing God does, he gives Habakkuk a vision of himself sitting high on a throne above it all. And he says, Habakkuk, if I'm still on my throne, then you can trust me with your unanswered questions. Now, I want to get philosophical for just a moment. I want to ask a question. And hopefully, I'm not going to give you the answer, but I hope you come to a conclusion when I tell you a story. Is it possible for a good God to allow something when he could stop it? Think about that. Is it possible for a good God to allow something when he could stop it? Gregor Kukul, I don't know if I'm pronouncing right, pronouncing it right, but he wrote a book called The Story of Reality. And he presented this scenario. He said, imagine a, a commando in World War II who gets dropped behind enemy lines. And he is posing as a German officer so he can get into the concentration camp and plant a bomb that will destroy the gas chambers. Now imagine, he just gets there for the first time. Imagine that as he is mingling with other German officers, he sees a soldier, a German soldier, preparing to execute a prisoner. Now, that is an evil that he could stop by simply shooting the soldier. But at what cost would it come? He might save one person, but his mission is to save many. Many more lives would be lost in the long run if he prevented this individual death, but didn't stop the gas chambers from destroying thousands. So is it possible, even in the human realm, for a good person to allow something evil, even though he or she could stop it? Of course it is. He might allow lesser evil in order to prevent an even, even greater one. This might be a, this is a different illustration, but it's one that's happened to a lot of you. This is a personal illustration. On July the 5th, 2000, at the Indiana University Medical Center in Indianapolis, I had the second surgery for a cancer that had spread around my throat. And my surgeon was named Dr. Weisberger. He was very good, and he knew he was very good. You ever met a doctor like that? I mean, he was confident. So when I went back a week after surgery, I was surprised to hear him say, we believe we got all your cancer, but we can't be 100% sure and because you are so young, we're recommending radiation to your neck. And I thought, well, that doesn't sound too bad. So I'm set up the Evansville Cancer Center. They equipped me for, with a mask for my face. And I thought that was to protect my face from radiation. Actually, that was wrong. It had a hole in this end, and it had a hole in this end. And it was, it was so they could tarp strap my head so it wouldn't move while they were zapping me with radiation. They had me put on gloves that had tarp straps on them. They tarp strapped my feet as I was laying there. And what they did was they did not want me to move. About three weeks in, my throat was so sore, I couldn't swallow. I was drinking one can of boost a day. And I went to my doctor and I told him, I think I better stop this. He said, you can stop, but if you do, you're gonna have to start all over again. My response was, okay, you're going to have to do something to get me through this. So he put me in the hospital and he ran IV fluids through me and, and left an IV in and ran fluids in every other day. I lost 65 pounds in three months. My throat was very, very sore. But my point is this. I was glad to have something painful happen to me because I knew something better was going to come out of it. Is it not possible 
that a lot of the pain that God allows us to go through on earth might be like that too? Just like those operations produced a healthier life, might it be that our pain in life will yield a greater and a happier eternity? You say, but I can't see any good coming out of this. Folks, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's not happening. Can we get to that point? If I ask you today, is there an elephant in this room? Now, you can look around and you can with reasonable certainty say, no, there's not an elephant in this room. But if I say, are there any lice in this room? You can take a quick, quick, quick look around and say, no. But I want to tell you something. Just because you can't see any lice, that confidence would be unwarranted. The person right in front of you could have a head full of them. I'm just kidding, okay? But I want to warn the next person with that scratches their head is going to be looked at with suspicion, okay? The point is this. Catch this. Understanding all the purposes of an all-wise God might be more like locating fleas than spotting elephants. One preacher said, great one, at any given point, and you need to understand this. This is the best I got for you today. At any given point, God is doing about 10,000 different things in your life, and you're aware of about three of them. Folks, he's God. I'm not. And neither are you. And faith trust God with that. Is God on his throne? That's the fundamental question we have to answer, which leads us now to Habakkuk's great statement of faith, which is one of the greatest in all the Bible. That's in Habakkuk 3, life-giving hope. He says, O Lord, I've heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. And then in the next 15 verses, you know what he's going to do? He's simply going to recount the exodus of God's people out of Egypt and their entrance into the promised land. He said, I, I, I'm thinking about who you are. He said, I'm thinking about, God, all the things that you've done in the past. <clears throat> Folks, the Exodus was the Old Testament's ultimate picture of salvation. Like, for instance, in 3-4, his brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand. That was a reference to God's appearance at Mount Sinai. Folks, we don't do enough justice to what happened at Mount Sinai. You ought to read that. Check it out. Verse 5 says, before him went pestilence and plagues followed at his heel. That's referring to the ten plagues used to strike Egypt. The mountain saw, verse 10, saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice and lifted its hands on high. Do you get this? It's like the waters were raising up on both sides. One hand, the left hand, and the right hand. And they were simply standing up. And right in the middle, the, the Israelites walked through. That was a reference to the splitting of the Red Sea. The sun and moon and sun and moon stood still in their place at the flash of your glittering power. Remember in Joshua chapter 10, uh, as they're going into the promised land, Joshua asked God, will you make the sun stand still because we need more daylight to win this battle? And it did. He says in verse 13, you went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from head to the neck. That's referring to how God brought the most powerful man in the world down to his knees, the Pharaoh of Egypt. So here's what happens. Habakkuk meditates for 15 verses, and that meditation is going to remind him of several things. First thing it reminds me of is, first, in reality, we are not really innocent people who are suffering. I hate to tell you this, I am not innocent. In the Exodus, God was delivering his people from slavery, and folks, their captivity in Egypt was a picture, sometimes, of the self-imposed slavery of sin. God did not create us to suffer, but we as a race, the human race, Put that on ourselves by rejecting God. And by the way, I have participated in that rebellion. I'm pretty sure you have too. Let me be clear here. I'm not saying that particular bad thing in your life. 
I'm not saying that bad things in your life are happening because you sinned at, at some point, as if God is saying, you know, you did this back in high school, and I'm going to pay you back for it, for that. What I am saying is that suffering in general, everybody's, exists in the world because the human race sinned, which we've all done. Which means that none of us can ever really point our finger at God and say, God, I don't deserve any of this. Our sin warranted eternal death. So the fact that you woke up this morning and experienced sunshine on your face and breath in your lungs is a bestowal of mercy. In Luke chapter 13, a tower fell on 18 Israelites and killed them. And the people asked Jesus, were they more wicked than others? Is that why they were killed? And Jesus said, no, not really. But unless you repent, you're all going to perish. In other words, the question is, why did the tower fall on those 18? When he says the question should have been, why didn't the tower fall on you too? We come to God with this question. Why are bad things happening to good people? And God says, all have sinned and fall short of my glory. And the wages of sin is death. And there's none righteous, not even one. So the question is not, why do bad things happen to good people? It is why, why are good things still happening to bad people? R.C. Sproul was asked, why do bad things happen to good people? He said, well, when I meet a good people, I will let you know. Habakkuk realizes we got a lot of suffering in this world because we live in a sinful, fallen world. The next time you're suffering or somebody else is suffering, repeat that. We live in a sinful, fallen world. Secondly, Habakkuk's meditation reminds him God's not short on power. God manipulated the most powerful nations in the world at will. He split rivers in two. He made the sun stand still at night. He remained light so the Israelites could fight and win a battle. He's not limited by anything. And thirdly, God's not given up on us. God delivered his people for a purpose. He delivered his nation for a purpose. And it wasn't to bring us out into the wilderness and die for the Egyptian or for the Israelites and he's not ever going to let the purpose he has for us go so I can still be confident that the God who delivered us is still working in us today so after meditating on those things Habakkuk says verse 16 <clears throat> I hear my body trembles my lips quiver at the sound at the sound rottenness enters into my bones my legs tremble beneath me he is still in fear about what is to come. He says, my circumstances haven't changed. He said, I dread the coming invasion of Babylon, the deprivation, the death. And folks, I want to tell you something. Maybe for you, it's the coming sickness. Maybe it's growing older. Maybe it's the dissolving family. Maybe it's financial hardship. And here's what I want to tell you. Maybe none of that's changed. But here's Habakkuk's resolve. Yet I wait quietly for the day of trouble of for, for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. He says, I'm going to adopt a posture of quiet repose, even though my heart feels this way, even though my emotions are this way, he says, I choose to be at peace. And then he says in verse 17, I love this is probably the best he's got. Though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vines. The produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Folks, if you're a farmer, what that means is crop failure. That means 1983. Okay, get that. If you remember that year. That's what it means. He said, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Amen. This is the faith that God had called for in chapter two when he said the righteous one will live by faith. And what characterizes that faith, folk, is life giving hope. And here's what we learn about hope as I close. Hope 
can exist alongside grief. Verse 16, you see all those emotions he has there? And then you see in the midst of that, he says, I will rejoice. Folks, nothing had changed. And the reason I'm bringing this up is there's real danger when we talk of these things. And they, they, man, that first song hit. You know, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. There's real danger is this, when we talk about these things, that we are implying that faith is some kind of just stiff upper lift stoicism, or that you're being filled with sorrow as a lack of faith. That's not what you see in the Bible. Job 1 says, when Job heard about the terrible things that had happened to his business and then his family, he arose, it says, he tore his garments, he fell on the face, fell on the ground, and in all these things he sinned not. He grieved big time. He wailed. Jesus was perfect, yet it says he was with sorrow and sometimes wept. Paul commands the believers, grieve, but just don't do it like those with no hope. Folks, it is possible to have great hope, even in the midst of great sorrow. Secondly, hope is a choice. He says in verse 16, I will wait patiently. Verse 18, I will rejoice. Folks, that's the language of choice, which is why in Philippians, Paul is going to make it a command. Remember this in Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say it, rejoice. Folks, you don't have to command people to do something they're already doing. Which means I am looking at people who are not rejoicing and saying, God tells you to rejoice. God tells you to rejoice. Rejoicing is not a description of the feelings that you possess, folk. It's a choice to posture your heart to what you know to be true, even when when you don't feel it. Here's the second great thought I have for you today. Your feelings don't have brains. Write that one down. Your feelings don't have brains. You have to tell your feelings how to feel. You can't command yourself to be happy, but what you can do is explain to yourself why you should be happy, what good things you've got, and why your emotions are not being truthful to you. When you're going through it, folk... What you need to do is to get down and and in your mind and in your heart, make a list of all how God has been so good to you. See, faith realizes that it possesses something in God that is deeper and better than anything else that life can give and something more secure than anything death can take away. So hope comes from remembering and repeating. Folks, we need to learn a lesson from Habakkuk. How he rehearsed the exodus. The Bible never tells you anything just once, hardly, does it? It repeats it over and over. Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. You know what he does then? He goes over all his benefits. And your spiritual health will be directly determined by how often you you review the benefits of your salvation And the God behind it all. Folk, I'll be honest with you. I don't flatter myself that any one sermon of mine will sustain you for the rest of your life. This sermon might get you to noon. You understand what I'm saying? And then you're going to have to review the ways and the glory of God. When life saps your strength, you got to force yourself to remember And repeat, remember, and repeat. And this is the last thing I got to tell you this morning. The heights of hope come from the depths of faith. Chapter 3, verse 19. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Folks, in ancient times, the highest place was the safest. Because you couldn't be attacked. And you could see for miles in all directions. When God becomes your strength, when God becomes your joy, that is what you'll be like. You'll have a joy safely above what pain or distress 
or death or disappointment can destroy, and you won't stumble even in the toughest seasons of life. See, here's the deal. I don't know what's going on in your life. And for the most part, you don't either. God's doing things that you've never even thought about. He's working on you. The first year I went down to, uh, to the DR, I bought a shirt. Uh, and on the back, it had a guy doing some carpentry work. And it said, man at work. But then it had crossed out man and put God. We all wear that shirt all the time. God is at work. And he's at work in you. And folks, do you understand? Sometimes surgery is necessary. Sometimes in order to say things, you got to be zapped with some heat to the neck. You get that? Some things, sometimes, in order to get to the good, you got to go through the bad. And that person that says they know why, I'll, I'll just say it this way. Don't ever attempt to explain why to somebody, because you're not God, and I'm not either. And that person that tries to explain it is probably in territory they had not to be in. The next time somebody says, why did this happen? Here's what we need to tell them. I don't know. But I can tell you how to get through it. Change your mind. Train your mind. Folks, feelings... Feelings are not always faithful, but your heart can be with hope. That's Habakkuk told us. Let's pray. Father, I, I, I'm just flabbergasted sometimes at how short-sighted I am. And my guess is maybe some others here we're so short-sighted because we think so much in the here and now. And we forget the later on. We think so much on the earthly things. And we forget about the heavenly things. Father, help us to start reviewing and repeating all the good things you've done. Help that to at least be a, a, a weekly chore and maybe a daily task that we do because we realize that will help us to have hope. And as Scotty read a couple of weeks ago, we have this hope. And as Romans 5 says, that hope does not disappoint. We're thankful for the confident assurance we have of the good that's going to come. Help us to hang on to hope.